name is Garrett Buell Robinson. I'm 42 years old. And for the last 18, 19 months, I've been selling my books out on the streets. My sign is my shop. It's a portable shop. I carry everything in my book bag and this little sign. And that's very enticing, I believe, for people to have an opportunity to meet an author. Thank you! The people approach me, they're going to be approaching me on the basis of the literary works that I have on display. And that gives me a chance to be able to demonstrate the merit in my ability to communicate. He goes out there um, practically every day, the rain, um, snow, sleet, whatever. I'm worried just about every single article of clothing that I own. So I've got four of everything on. I wake up in the morning at 7 o'clock and I'm generally at the subway station about 7.15, 7.20. And then I ride into Manhattan to the Chelsea District where I visit my storage unit, pick up my books for the day. And then I jump back on the subway and ride to the main library branch on 42nd Street. And then I set up shop. Well, there's quite a number of different models of chairs out in the park. There's one particular model that is especially comfortable for me because I'm sitting in it for six or eight hours a day. And there's not too many of those chairs in the park, but I always try to find them every day. And typically, I get lucky. Generally, about like three, four, maybe 500 people have to pass before one person stops. So I have to place myself in a location where there will be thousands of people that pass me on a daily basis. A lot of people might have some skepticism about a book being self-published, and I tell them that Walt Whitman was self-published, Henry David Thoreau was self-published. There were so many writers that were self-published that are literary luminaries considered today. I realize that I'm requesting to take people's time out of their life. And I want to make absolutely sure if somebody does make the choice to focus their attention on my works, they're going to be something beneficial for them in it. He'll actually hand the book to the person, say, turn to page 54, and then he'll read the whole passage to them. The first notion is that I'm running from something. If I am, I could only be running from myself. And check out my website, too. I'm not the most technically savvy, but I've been presenting a lot of things on my Facebook page and on my YouTube site and various other social media sites as well, too. I had a post that got about 50 likes on Facebook, which is an accomplishment for me. I mean, I don't even know 50 people. and I mean, that includes my, f my family. <laughs> I'm originally from Trussville, Alabama. This is actually a photograph of my hometown. My mother told me that I returned from school when I was eight years old, told her I was going to be a writer. I started writing my first novel when I was 12 years old. I was extremely disappointed with myself though early on. It was terribly derivative. I was basically rewriting J.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings again. So I told myself I wasn't going to write anything original, I wasn't going to write at all. So I gave it up. At 14, I went off to a military school in Virginia, not for disciplinary reasons, just for educational reasons. And I went to the University of the South in Swanee, Tennessee. And I had no problems whatsoever with the academics. I was not socially prepared, though. And I was not able to interact with people on a social basis. So I figured, like anything else, that I just needed to try hard. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you. Of course, you can't do that socially. You just end up scattering people, and I did. I scattered quite a number of crowds. Because Atlantis is often considered the utopian society. So I just stuffed a bunch of clothes and stuff in my dad's old army duffel bag and walked to the railroad tracks. And the first train I was leaving happened to be a coal train. I remember just taking these steps along the, on the gravel and then just slipping, and the bag was pulling me down and everything. And I remember so distinctly reaching up and grabbing the ladder. And I just pulled myself up. It was like the train had me. I just wandered around the country for just about an entire year, just hitchhiking. And when I would run out of money, I would just pick up a temporary job and replenish my funds and then continue my travels.
And as I was hitchhiking, it gave me an opportunity to be able to introduce myself to a number of people. And I could talk briefly to them and not have to be concerned about any implications or any consequences to my statements. After that stint, I did start making an effort to try to approach people, generally in public parks. You like poetry? Really, for the last 20 years, I've been bouncing around a lot. I and mean, sometimes I even feel like I get kicked around a lot, quite a bit. At one point, I remember in my mid-twenties, when I was living in Portland, Oregon, there was a six-month stretch where I was at a point where I didn't say more than three words a day. And so I didn't have any direct interaction with anybody on a personal basis for a while. I decided in the mid-90s that I needed to engage myself in a large project. So I decided that I would write a novel within five years. Then the curtain lifts with a rush of Niagara. The music moves, filling the openness with consoling tones. I worked in Alaska briefly for two years, on and off. Then I moved to San Francisco in 2002. I'd written quite a number of books by the time of when I was living in San Francisco. And I tried to contact publishers and literary agents. And, but I have no contact, so I wasn't having any luck in doing so. I started to tell myself, it's like, well, you know, maybe, uh, there is no legitimacy to my writing. Maybe I'm not able to communicate with people. I can't throw away what I've already done, but hopefully with what remains, I may say what I really feel instead of impulsively blurting rash nonsense. One of my mother's friends had heard that I'd quit smoking. and She asked me if I could compose a letter for her to explain how I did it. A number of people did read that letter and they were able to quit. And I felt if I was able to accomplish that, then without question, there had to be merit to my expressions. And so two years ago when I turned 40, I realized that if I'm gonna to move to New York, I need to do it now. The next stop is Times Square 47th Street. I thought that being in the city with uh, you know, the publishing center of the world, that I might be able to make some contacts with people in the industry. But then I told myself, though, even if I wasn't able to contact anybody, if I had to, I'd just sell my books out on the streets. The first day I went, I sat there for eight hours with my books and my little sign, and one person stopped. And that was just to take a photograph of me. <laughs> Initially, though, I was just doing like a cardboard box and then just writing Meet the Author on that. And that didn't work very well. I didn't sell a book for a long time. I went out there every single day, day after day, and I kept sitting there. With the amount of time that I put into as far as the composing of my works, to be able to reach the point where I could sell one book, Going for a few days without selling a book is nothing. Ten dollars, autographed copy. Thank you. It's definitely a extremely meager means of income, and I live far below what's considered the federal poverty level. I'd live in a shelter for about five months and kind of regather my resources. I've finally been able to find a place of my own again. When I did go to the shelter system, I was required to get food stamps. But other than that, I pay my rent and all my other expenses exclusively through the sales of my books. This space is pretty small, just about 80 square feet. I'm grateful I have it, you know, a place to live because it's a heck of a lot better in the streets. There's no question about it. When I was young, I used to love small spaces. I would go into drawers in the bathroom and just crawl into the drawers and close the drawers and just sit there in the darkness. I remember some like uh, Saturday and Sunday afternoons, I would sit the entire day in those spaces. I've lived for the most part a very solitary life, uh, especially over the last 20 years. The amount of time that I have to devote for my writing I don't have enough time and attention even to be able to support a goldfish, let alone a relationship with another person. He's a very good writer. Is he, you know, the next T.S. Eliot? I don't know. But his writing, it has a lot of soul and heart. He is selling the book, but he's giving you Garrett up front. 
For me, it is communication. I try to pour as much of my life onto the page with hopes that I might be able to reach out of the page and touch other people's lives. There are quite a number of people that read my books and they come back to me. And there's quite a number of people that visit me almost every day after they leave from work. Who may I sign this for? People have actually started to recognize me. And I walk around town sometimes and people say, oh, it's, you know, meet the other guy. And I was like, that guy sells books in front of the library. And, and uh, which is always pretty neat. I firmly believe the fact that we do make our own lives. And we're all artists in that regard because we all do compose our own existence. And we formulate that based upon our interests and the passion and intensity and the devotion to which we pursue them. Everything else is denied of me that it doesn't really seem to matter. It's maybe it's, you know, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. That's all I see and that's all I pursue. It does get grueling, there's no question about it, but it's one of those gratifying experiences I could ever possibly have.